it is difficult for a game to be truly uninteresting. It requires an unlikely convergence of events to perfectly thread the needle between good and terrible to create the unremarkable, something functional but also joyless and flat. Babylon's Fall is one such convergence. The generic dark fantasy storyline is pointless, and the worst-in-class textures and character models suck any visual appeal out of what could have been an interesting painted canvas art style. Combat and level design are both competent but plain in single-player or co-op, with just enough good ideas sprinkled in to keep things from immediately growing stale, though it inevitably does over its 15-plus hour campaign. Something tells me we're in for trouble. The world of Babylon's Fall could have been constructed via Mad Libs, you are a mighty noun protecting place from the forces of evil thing with your trusty weapon. Platinum Games' answer to these prompts are Sentinel, Babylon, The Gallus, and Gideon Coffin, respectively. There's nothing remotely memorable about any of these things except the last. This thing is a weird device fused to your spine that projects a pair of ghost arms and lets you wield a total of four weapons at once. That's kind of neat. The story is largely told in exposition-heavy still images, zooming from one fibrous picture frame to another. The painterly art direction had potential to be interesting, but it never gets the chance because Babylon's Fall is one of the worst looking games of the last several console generations. Everything is covered in awful textures, and NPCs all look like they were made by a random character generator from the mid-2000s. It's distracting how poorly done it all is, and it's all a facade that does little to cover all of the hideous models and jilted action. Three. Three souls have returned to us from the cruel depths of Tartarus! Praises to Jupiter! The monsters and environments you encounter would be right at home in an early Dark Souls game. Decaying castles and dark caves are home to all manner of grotesque creatures. It's a proven formula, and Babylon's Fall dutifully checks off items on the list of things a dark fantasy game is supposed to have. But while a Souls game can instill a sense of melancholy as you explore a richly detailed rotting fortress, or dread as you face off against a hideous abomination, Babylon's Fall fails to evoke any connection to the locations. Each level follows the same template. You load into a quest and run through linear corridors towards a marked point. There's very little room for exploration and virtually nothing interesting to find if you try. Transparent barriers occasionally form around you to create a sealed arena in which you're barraged by waves of generic enemies until you slay an arbitrary number of foes. Between those battles, environmental hazards like pits, spikes, and lava do just enough to keep at least some attention on the field of play, but it's easy to zone out while running down virtually the same ugly corridors time and again, rinse and repeat until you reach the boss fight at the end. One last damage sponge devoid of new mechanics or interesting attacks. <laughs> All of this is extremely linear, and the cycle grows tedious as you repeat it dozens of times. The saving grace to this is that the stages will often have unique twists, like floating platforms or this strafing dragon. Of course, they aren't necessarily all good twists, and some, like these machine gun turrets, are genuinely annoying. But they keep everything from being exactly the same, so on the whole, they're a good thing. There are many fights to be had in Babylon's Fall, and the combat is competent. You equip up to four different weapons, two in your hands that are your basic light and heavy attacks, and another pair that floats in the air behind you, attached to your Gideon Coffin via glowing tendrils. These ethereal attacks tend to do the most damage, but consume a stamina meter that is regenerated by regular attacks. What's clever about it is that changing which slot each weapon is equipped in can alter how they operate. A bow and arrow may work well for rapid fire shots from your hands, or be charged up in your Gideon coffin and use more like slow firing artillery while you hide behind a shield. There is a satisfying ferocity to skirmishes, but against tougher enemies it does devolve into extended bouts of pure button mashing while you stare at a health bar, running the same sequence of attacks in hand cramping perpetuity. Dodge rolls and aerial attacks add a small amount of variety, but be prepared to get a lot of use out of the same three buttons. The weapons and armor you use have varying rarities and levels, which is effective at moving you from one loadout to another as you progress. While there are only a small number of weapons, and each will be found repeatedly at ever-increasing power levels, randomized enchantments add a much-needed element of unpredictability. You may have a sword that increases your defense at one level, then find a more powerful version of the same weapon later, only this time it enhances your damage output. The effects tend to be minor, 
but the cycle of speeding through the toughest missions your group can handle, then eagerly sorting through drops and upgrading pieces in order to challenge an even tougher encounter is as compelling here as it is in any loot-based action RPG. There is an endgame once the main campaign is concluded, made up of high-level variations on missions called skirmishes and sieges that become available as opportunities to earn the most powerful gear. Skirmishes may contain infamous enemies that drop special loot, while sieges will emphasize combat or platforming. You also unlock new types of attack patterns and alternative abilities for your Gideon Coffin. Given how repetitive the campaign missions got before the endgame, holding these more interesting additions until the end is a questionable choice. Even so, they do little to change the actual experience of playing, so it's not as if introducing them earlier would have solved all of its problems. The biggest of those problems is that Babylon's Fall doesn't even come near to living up to its inspirations. For instance, multiple social aspects are like something pulled straight out of Monster Hunter. There is a hub town shared by players with quest boards, item shops, and a blacksmith. Quests can be undertaken with friends or random players, with a mix of story and side missions that can advance the plot or lead to finding better weapons and armor. It all works reliably well, and playing in a group of four people didn't noticeably impact the frame rate or general performance. However, joining up with a group of Sentinels has no strategic value beyond making missions pass more quickly. It even comes with drawbacks, like the fact that you can't change your equipment once matchmaking has begun. So it's impossible to tweak your build to work synergistically with your team. Because there are no character classes with defined roles like damage dealing, tanking, or support, more teammates just translates into more bodies rushing at the enemies, flailing their ghost arms with reckless abandon. In many ways, Babylon's Fall feels like the generic store brand of more famous games that came before. The combat is competent, but not engaging, and prone to degrading into repetitive button mashing as you trudge through linear level after linear level. Like nearly all action RPGs, its perpetual treadmill of increasing your power to take on greater challenges keeps the campaign afloat, but here it's bare bones, and rarely does it offer a twist to make progression compelling. Hints of a distinctive art style are wasted on drab environments and ugly character models. Ultimately, Babylon's Fall just isn't good. It's not terrible or broken, it just is, and does little to justify investing your time into it. For more, check out our reviews of Elden Ring and Elix 2, and for everything else, stick with IGN.